Good morning. I'm Greg Schaefer. Welcome to the virtual CISO moment. We're actually live today. Uh, a couple of moments late because I forgot to hit a button, but that's all good now. <laughs> <laughs> so we we had actually started this and went about a minute in before I realized, wait a minute, we got to hit the live button. So anyway, very special episode today. Mark Crudgington joins us today. He is the founder and CEO of Cyberforce Systems. He's also got a lot of experience being at the CISO level prior Air Force. Thank you for your service. But most importantly, and the reason why we're here today in this special episode is that he is the author of two books, including his latest book, which came out yesterday, The Cyber War is Here. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here and, and look forward to the conversation. Yes, and, and, and doing it again. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so, so we'd love to hear, we're going to get to the book in just a little bit, but we'd love to hear about your cybersecurity journey um, how you got started in cyber and why, and, and leading all the way up to your um, starting a business and, and then also um, writing um, a couple of books. But, but let's go all the way back to your Air Force days and start from there. Sure, absolutely. I, I joined the Air Force like many people just to get more experience for the adventure of it, um, you, know, edu you know, continue my education. Um, and, and that was uh, in 92, 1992. Uh, I, my, my first tour was in Germany and I joke around with people. They paid me to drink and travel and I did plenty of both. So, <laughs> um, but it was a, it was a good time. I was in Ramstein, which is like the center of Germany. And um, so I got to do a lot of traveling um, and it was a great experience. But my second tour was in Onizuka Air Base, which is no longer there, but it's in it's on Moffett Field in the San Francisco Bay Area, really smack dab in the middle of Silicon Valley. And I don't think I got off the plane before I decided I'm getting out of the Air Force in four years. You know, what better place to land uh, for, you know, a computer nerd um, that was really wanting to get more into technology. So I got out after four years and, and went to work um, at 3Com. But my Air Force background was interesting because I did a number of different things. Um, all of them, of course, because I had a top secret clearance and was in computer intelligence and all that, were security related, though I wasn't a security guy. Um, but then I went to work for 3Com and because of that Air Force experience, they wanted me to do a lot of, uh, or went to work for 3Com, they wanted me to do a lot of you know, security type things, you know, and setting up networks and securing them and, and that. And this was way back before security was as, as cool as it is now. Um, but I, um, I I transferred to another role there um, as a software engineer doing engineering verification work. Um, and that was really eye opening. I got to travel around with one of the marketing engineers, um, marketing sales engineers, um, and we'd go to customer sites. And that's where I realized that, look, I'm not the guy that's going to sit in his cubicle or office all day long and just bang away on the keyboard. I like being out and meeting customers. So my, my next job, I was picked up by a former director at 3Com. And then... Um, I did the same thing. I, I was primarily doing verification engineering, but I was helping them because it was a startup. I mean, we hadn't even released a version one of the product yet. Um, I got to help design the security uh, mm -hmm. for the product, um, which was really neat. And then help train customers on the product and a number, number of interesting customer interfacing type positions. And, you know, somewhere into that journey, um, I, I met my my wife and then um, the dot com bomb went off in the early 2000s. And we wanted to move to Southern California where she was from. I was pursuing um, a career in the entertainment industry at the time, uh, you know, movie studios and so forth. And she just wanted to be closer to family. Hmm. Um so that led me then into going into consulting at a big four firm. Um, and again, because I had a lot of experience, typically consulting firms bring you in at a beginning stage and they really mentor you and watch you and make sure you don't, you know, um, do something to upset the client or whatever. They left me out on site. My first job was a, uh, a business continuity disaster recovery assessment and then advisement role. 
Um, they left me for a very large credit union. They left me out on the site, you know, alone. They dropped off the work papers and they said, you know, here you go. Uh, I'll see you in a month uh, when the engagement's over. And and they said, if you need any help, just let me know. So my career in big four um, in, in consulting was very much what I really enjoyed. The customer facing aspect, helping customers yeah. improve things. But what, what it did is, you know, it helped me pursue uh, the business side of things. And I had gotten a four year business degree while I was in the, in the Silicon Valley, but I wanted to go on and get my MBA. And that was kind of that consulting, you know, the light bulb moment that, yes, this is something that I could see myself doing long term versus just sitting in a cubicle. And, yeah. you know, to each his own. I mean, every, you know, there's a lot of people that love that engineering work and they don't want to go into management or anything like that. And I applaud them. Um, and, and those people I love because they are the ones that I go to for implementations and all that. Well, then um, family f- issues happened. Um, I moved my family uh, to Houston, where I was, the Houston area was where I was from, went to work at Wood Forest uh, National Bank. I was their first ever CISO. Wood Forest is a very large uh, regional bank. And in fact, they're considered the largest bank in the U.S. for in-store branches. They're in a lot of Walmart, some Kroger's, grocery stores, that kind of thing. It was a great experience there. Um, I started there in 2012. Um, and, you know, about, um, you know, seven years in, um, I had started my own business as a side business. The reason why I started that is I, I believe everybody should own some kind of business, whether it's a hobby business, a side business, that kind of thing. Yeah. Just helps you learn a lot of different things that you may not be doing currently uh, in, in your role. Um, so then, you know, and, and the side hustle is the thing now. Uh, but it was it was quite interesting. I had a lot of people that were asking me for advice and, you know, hey, you know, what, what would you do in this situation? Obviously, financial services is one of the greatest places to be in cyber. One, they have a lot of mandates. But also you're going to be working with a lot of, you know, cutting edge, fraud, all different aspects of cyber. So it's pretty interesting. Um, Then I started my own business. And at some point I got the bug just to give it a shot and and try and go out on my own. And so I did that in in June of 2021 Mm -hmm. after the pandemic subsided a bit. But it's very tough being a, especially if you're not that kind of person, tough being a a solopreneur, entrepreneur with a small team, that kind of thing. It's very siloed and, you know, quite frankly, lonely. And oh gosh, yeah. And and I know a lot of folks sometimes I I I get questions all the time asking me about advice of starting a small business and consulting and all that. And yeah. And one of the things I try to turn them away from is that it seems like a lot of times people will want to go that route because they think that it's like easier and more fun and, and there are easy and com- and more fun components with it but but yeah it, it comes with a lot of work and yeah I'm not, and i would say the only thing that's that was funner to me is that i got to v- see a lot of different customer sites yeah. and yeah I you, love know, that I, too. you know i was consulting and and selling product and all that but you know if you're if you're really starting out and you are by yourself or you have a, a you know part-time team or consultant team it is very lonely and, and I'm not that kind of person. I, I get my energy from being around people. So, and, and I had to go back to my childhood to figure this out. Um, and, you know, I know we'll talk about the mental health aspects, but I, I'm very big on that. Um, yeah. that. You have to take care of your mental health above all else. Um, so I, I said, you know, ever since I've been like, you know, four or five years old, I've been on a team, you know, going back to T-ball. And I really miss that. And so that's why I went back and pursued a, uh, a full-time CISO position. Um, and uh, things didn't work out there recently. Um, don't want to get into the details of that, but I resigned. Um, and um, so that was just a few weeks ago. So, so here I am and um, my book launch. So I, I've got a lot of things going on. So it was kind of like, okay, not a big deal. I still have my side business and, and, and I'm working on things there, but I'm pursuing a lot of personal goals. 
so that's kind of my story. I've been a, a, a CISO um, three times in the role, full time, probably another four or five uh, as a VCSO, um, doing various things. My career, it's like that Robert Frost poem, um, two roads diverged in a, in a wooded area and I took the less traveled one. Mm. That's kind of my career. And um, I am, am so happy that my journey is my journey. And I've been very blessed to, to do the things that I've done and see the places that I've seen. Uh, and I really love giving back. That's where I get my energy. I mentioned from people is giving back to the next generation, mm -hmm. teaching, mentoring, conversations with peers. I mean, it's just awesome to be around the people that we get to be around. Well, that's a great story. I appreciate you bringing us through that. And with all that experience and everything, I'm going to ask you in just about 30 seconds, what you think is the most significant threat or threats to small and mid-sized businesses today. So we'll pick that up in just about half a minute. VCSO Services is a small, specialized, veteran-owned information security firm with a calling, founded on Christian values and focused on the needs of small and mid-sized businesses. Our passion is to help small and mid-sized businesses gain a fighting chance in an increasingly hostile cybersecurity threat environment by providing executive part-time virtual CISO services, information security risk management services, and CISO advisory services. Check them out at vcsoservices.com. All right, Mark, you've had about a half a minute to think about that, although I think you probably had the answer beforehand in your head. So what do you think is one of the most significant threats to small and mid-sized businesses, cybersecurity today? Yeah, I, I think it's quite simple. And this this is you know no different from some of the larger companies. But as a smaller mid-sized business, more than likely, you don't have to worry about nation state attacks. Mm -hmm. But you do have to worry about all the threats that are just lingering out there that could get on your endpoint system. And you probably know this from anything, Greg, that, um, you know, users are the hardest people to train at times. And sometimes small businesses, because they're so hard, you know, after chasing after revenue and that they don't want to spend the appropriate amount of money or they think they're not going to be next. Um, and something happens. So probably I would say it's protecting their endpoints. And that can mm -hmm. be, you know, uh, PCs, uh, workstations, can be their servers, can be IoT devices, depending on the industry they're in. But it would be how they protect their endpoints. So many times I see I go into clients or I've been into clients and they're using a very inadequate endpoint protection system. And just for a little bit more money, they could be up with a global enterprise protecting their endpoints. So that would be one. Um, I think that culture of, of cybersecurity and again, I'm, I'm, maybe they're public, maybe they're not. I mean, if they're public, they got SEC disclosures to worry about now. But if they're not public, it's like, how do you ingrain that security culture in this fast moving or, um, you know, businesses may have been around for quite some time and is just used to doing things a, a specific way. And they may not have, as you know, they may not have a CISO or even somebody in, depending on how big they are, in, in cybersecurity, um, might be an IT guy or, or what. So it's just getting the basics right to where they're like, maybe they're not 100% or you can never be 100% obviously, but you get what I mean. Maybe not. they're not at the very, very um, top echelon, but they're 90% of the way where they make it just hard enough for threat actors that they're going to go on because threat actors, they want to be efficient. They want to move. They want to get in. They want to get, get what they need and get out yeah. um, or disrupt depending on their goal. Um, but they don't want to have to, especially a small business, if it's not a hard target, they don't want to just lay in there for six, seven, eight months trying to get into the environment. No. when there's like thousands of other companies they can pop within minutes, you know? Um, so I, I would think it's really around that and then the knowledge of how they need to protect that environment in the most um, efficient manner and cost effective manner. Well, and of course, understanding the threat environment is is part of that to understand what you need to protect. And 
I want to talk a little bit now about the cyber war is here. This is uh, your take from your perspective as a CISO that all of our infrastructure is currently under attack is what I gather from, from the liner notes, if you will. I haven't read the book yet, but um, tell us a little bit about what that's all about. Sure. The first book, which is The Coming Cyber War, was spawned off of a conversation I had with uh, Colonel Cedric Layton. He's he's on TV an awful lot. Uh, I was at a, our Gartner conference in Washington, D.C., and met up with him. We became friends before that, but we just started talking about a lot of things that were going on at the time, you know, and primarily it was around Russian meddling and a lot of other things going on. Um, but on the way back, I took the ferry over on the way back um, over to National Harbor from where we were at in Alexandria. I just started thinking about like, wow, we're, we're really in a cyber war right now. And it's kind of, a, I, I, I liken it to the ocean's current. You don't, you, you don't really know it's there until you're actually in it. And then when you're mm -hmm. in it, you're like, oh, my God, this is crazy. Um, and that same thing with an incident. You know, if you're dealing with an incident, same thing. So it spawned that. And but this that book came out in October of 2020. And I predicted a lot of things would happen in the coming years in that book. Uh, well, they started happening in December of 2020 mm. with solar winds then colonial pipeline happened then we had a lot of microsoft stuff a lot of other breaches and i was like oh my god when colonial pipeline happened i, I wanted to write my book again right after solar winds i was like oh my god this is this is gonna get interesting real quick um and then colonial pipeline happened i was like i, I just started gathering data but it I wanted to put a different, a little bit different spin on this about, you know, critical infrastructure. I'm part of the FBI's InfraGuard program, you know, which is a partnership between the FBI and um, the the public sector um, and our private sector. And then, so I gathered a lot of data and I, just doing the research on a book like this is it's very interesting because, you know, I, I was digging deep going back to the 80s on some critical infrastructure attacks and just breaking it down like motives and all that. So I talk a little bit more. I get a little bit more in the weeds on this book, but not it, it is an every man's book. Um, you don't need to be a cyber expert. I, I don't want to write a book for, you know, the you know, a thousand people in the, in the country. Uh, I write it for everyone. Even if you don't know anything about cyber, uh, you can pick this book up and understand it. The threat actors and so forth I get into, that might be a little in the weeds, but it talks about what they do and why they do it and that. But it really gets into how we are, our critical infrastructure. A lot of people think, okay, this is just a cyber incident. No, it's attack on our national security and our financial security as a country. When you talk about all the intellectual property theft and the innovation, the years spent innovating, whether it be in pharma or technology or, you know, any type of industry you can think of, we're that is really hurting us in in hurting us from staying way ahead. You know, semiconductors, anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it that's one of the things. But then I also focus on. The relationship, obviously, I'm a, I'm a CISO, and you can see a CISO's perspective. So I focus on some dynamics between the CISO and the board, CISO and other executives, CISO being chief information security officer, um, and how a board should govern cyber, how a CISO should run their program, or, or some best practices, I should say. Each program is different. Um, so, so there's a lot to unpack in there. But I have these uh, use cases, what I call from the desk of a CISO, and that's where a CISO's perspective. I actually interviewed CISOs or people in similar roles, but I got to interview my son, um, he, who's at a first first year student at University of Texas San Antonio, and that's about the talent gap. So you know, mm -hmm. I interviewed him. Why you want? Why do you want to go into cyber? And it wasn't because of me. Uh, so I'll. There, there's interesting use cases about supply chain, about how to partner, how uh, choosing the right partner and what to expect, the culture aspects from uh, some really good people. So that's kind of the, the book in a nutshell. 
what I think, if you, if I had to sum it up in one word, what I think, it's, it's really a call to action by, by our, our nation and our, our allies, and not just the government, not just corporations, but all people, and why we should take cybersecurity more seriously. I mean, it, it's a trickle-down effect uh, that has everything to do with, you know, the, the hiring we do and the amount of people we can hire all of that because of the intellectual property that we're losing and, you know, some of the data that we're losing. I mean, it, it's a it's a stressor on our economy and stressor on our national security. It truly is a systemic risk that um, rises all the way to the top of, of the enterprise. I think the idea you touched on um, culture and particularly within critical infrastructure, I, my eyes Everybody, I think, has, you know, talk about a CISO perspective. My eyes were, were opened one time when I was uh, interviewing for a, uh, um, actually, it was a CIO position um, with a uh, large media company and was doing a tour of their facilities and printing press. Now, mind you, this is, um, oh, 15-ish years ago, 12 years ago, something like mm -hmm. that. I think something like that, maybe a little bit more. Um, so, but newspapers were still a big thing back then. And... Yeah. Uh, wonderful thing looking at the, and of course, media is critical infrastructure. You control the media, you control the narrative. We've seen that that can change the world literally. Well, yes. what really shocked me is that of course, being a technical and security minded person, I pinged on this one machine that was sitting next to the printing press and it was running windows 95 and they're like, well, we have to run it because that's the only thing our software will run on. I'm like, well, 95 went end of life, like 12 years ago or whenever it was at the time. I mean, it shocked me that, yes. and, and and if, if someone had gotten in and changed something within the printing press or changed or inserted something, I don't know. But 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 I, that's a big worry of mine as well too, that, that the critical infrastructure, you just don't have people taking it seriously enough. So um, definitely appreciate you tackling that. I'm looking forward to reading it. They, uh, it's available on Amazon, um, correct? Yeah, it's available on Amazon, Barnes. I mean, uh, um, I haven't checked. Obviously, it just just you know publicly launched yesterday, but it should be on all book bookstores. Um, you know, book that you would normally buy Barnes, Walmart, even um, you know, obviously Amazon. Um, okay. Some number of locations. Well, I know that being in cyber. Um, particularly with all of this, the more you dive into the reality and environment, the more stressful it becomes. So I'm almost like, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, I'm going to read your book, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to get my mindset up that I'm probably going to be discouraged by some of the things that I read. It can get, be, it can get to be very stressful. And us in the security realm, you talked, touched on just briefly beforehand in the beginning about mental health. We have a huge problem, and I, I believe in our field of um, burnout and and also some other mental health issues and i my personal perspective is that i think that it's important that we get away and we get away from cyber and also you've you've been doing the small business uh, ownership that you do now somewhat as well too that can be stressful it's very difficult to start a small business what's one of the things that you do to get away from the stress to decompress well, I, I think it's primarily would be travel, um, sp you know, traveling, spending time with my family. But if it's just like kind of a local thing, I enjoy I enjoy movies and I really enjoy uh, concerts, uh, you know, live music concerts. are uh, It's a good way to get away. I think just another simple way is just, you know, going to a, I know it's not a total escape, but like getting out of your normal element. So maybe mm -hmm. going to a conference or something or going to a happy hours, you know, with with other cyber prof professionals or IT professionals, anything like that thing that can just get you out of out of your norm. But, you know, I, you know, locally, it's it's concerts. If, if it's really like a vacation, I do take my vacations. Um I feel anybody that doesn't take a vacation or their vacation time is, you know, really um, it's kind of you're asking for trouble. Just put it that way from a from a burnout perspective. Uh, well, as, just, as, as an employer, it's like I encourage my mm -hmm. employees. It's like, no, take time off because uh, I want you to be refreshed because someone who takes time off, they're going to be more productive. There's a little selfish component, obviously. It's like, well, yeah, 
productive, but it does work out that way. You come back refreshed after you go through the whole Monday email trying to figure out what planet you're back on again. Eventually you come back in, you use in, and it's a lot more refreshed. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um future plans, so you know, I so so you've now if I get the titles right, you the the baseline titles of your two books. The first one was the Cyber War is Coming. The second one is The Cyber War is Here. I'm hoping that your future plans include a third one in the trilogy, The Cyber War is Ended, <laughs> but probably <laughs> not going to be quite there. Um, what are what are uh, what are um, some future plans you might want to mention? Well, yes, certainly. Um, I have a with the book. I have a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was the coming cyber war, and it was in the middle of the the pandemic, so I didn't get to do a lot of book tour kind of thing. This one, I'm going to do a lot of book signings, articles, other other things to promote it. Um, but I'm, you know, I am thinking of writing a third book. I might just do an article because I don't want to write another book. I'd rather write a screenplay. Um, based on this book or genre. I'm really interested in that. But, you know, work-wise, I am, you know, going back into industry. I was back in the industry for about 10 months. So I'm going to be pursuing CIO um, and uh, CISO positions. Um, I would really like to work for a large global company, you know, in that role or a similar role. Uh, I would also love to work for like VC firms doing as a CISO in residence or large technology technology firms as a CISO in residence. I like the customer facing aspects of things. You know, it's just the, the, the CISO position or that role affords you the ability to do a lot of different things. And that's what I find very appealing. Um, so that's kind of what's going on a little bit. I'm, I'm also pursuing some certifications and, and other things. I just completed a MIT class um, certification or certificate of completion uh, for AI. I, I really enjoy learning about AI and, and that. Um, so, you know, there's some personal things in there as well as, you know, uh, career aspects and career aspirations. I sense that there might be an AI cyber book in your future. Or maybe a screenplay. Oh, wait, wait. No, they did that with Terminator, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, listen, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate having you on. The book is The Cyber War is Here. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and your favorite book source. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for having me. And everybody, stay secure.